Welcome back to the second session in our module looking at the controversial topic of corrective discipline and restoration. Last time we defined corrective discipline as any action initiated and implemented by church leaders in response to the unscriptural attitudes or behavior of a believer within the church community which has the transformation of their character and conduct as the goal. We then looked at three attitudes every leader must adopt in corrective discipline, compassion, firm resolved, and commitment to, to restoration. And to ground our discussion, we then looked at three representative reasons why leaders may need to bring corrective discipline. Uh, number one, immorality. Number two, propagating false doctrine. And number three, broken relationships. Now to the big question. What is a process of bringing corrective discipline? What I'm about to share are suggestions based on my and others' experience. My advice would be to embrace and apply the principles that relate to you and your cultural context, but just ignore things that may not be. These are principles, not a how-to manual. Let me repeat something really important. The reason we implement corrective discipline is not to punish, but to correct. It is for remedial and, re and restorative purposes. So let's begin. Number one, prepare your heart and mind to speak to the person concerned. The first step is that as soon as you become aware of something, prepare to act. Don't procrastinate. The longer you leave it, the worse it may, may become. I'd suggest you take the following preparatory steps before you speak with the person. A know your authority and operate within it. Do you have the authority to bring co corrective discipline or should it be referred to your oversight? If you are authorized, then operate within the sphere of your authority with confidence. Depending on the nature of the issue, it is always wise to let your immediate oversight know of what, what is happening. You may not initially mention names, but seek counsel or advice. Now, why is this important? to bring the matter under the appropriate godly oversight, to follow right biblical lines of accountability, to gain wisdom, to learn from your leader's experience, and to cover yourself in case further action is necessary. If you are the senior leader, advise the eldership or board or seek legal advice, especially if it could potentially become a legal or criminal matter. You should know these things before you take any action. B. Find out as much information as possible before approaching the person. Try to get a really good grasp of the circumstances. Ascertain as best you can what happened, when, why and how. C. Adopt a clear, unbiased perspective at all times. And by that I mean to remain objective. Never have pre-drawn conclusions. D. Anticipate possible scenarios, objections, and responses. This helps to prepare your mind. And E, pray. Pray for love in all that you do and say. Pray for true discerning. Pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with you as you speak with the person. Pray for the person to come to repentance. Pray for their life to be fully restored. Step number two lovingly but firmly raise the issue with the person in private. Once you've made appropriate preparation, the second step would be that you, as the leader, go to the person concerned in private and lovingly but firmly raise the issue with, with, with them. How do you do this? Well, A, always begin and conclude by showing grace. This means affirming the person as distinct from their action. Show them respect and dignity as a fellow brother and sister in Christ. Treat them as you would want to be treated in such circumstances. B. Address the issue clearly with grace, but without minimizing the circumstances. They need to know exactly why you are talking with them, what the issues are, and why it was wrong. Stay calm. Keep your composure. What you say and how you say it will influence the other person's responses. C. Ask questions like, how do you see it? Is it true? Did you know what the Bible teaches about this issue? 
Do you know of any other relevant information? How could things have been done differently? And in this way, you can discern the true intentions, motives and state of their life. D. Listen attentively, carefully and discerningly to their answers. Don't judge until you've heard their answers. Be as objective as possible, but listen with empathy. E. Ascertain as best you can what degree of repentance is in the life of the person. Do they understand what, what they did or are doing is or was wrong? Are they sorry for their sin or sorry they got caught? Do they really want to change and deal with the issue in, in their life? F. Introduce what the Bible says about the issue. This means bringing corrective counsel from the scriptures and clearly enunciate what the Bible requires about the need for repentance. Instruct them in what the Bible says about seeking forgiveness. Share what the Bible teaches about right living. Urge them to seek transformation in, in their life. Point them to the grace of God. G. Act decisively and fairly. At this point, you'll have to make a decision about what corrective discipline is necessary. Ministry leaders can't avoid to be indecisive or wishy-washy. The matter must be handled firmly and fairly without embarrassment or unpleasantness. The person's dignity should be maintained at all times. Direct them in what they should do from here. This may involve things like confession, counselling or accountability structures as they, re as they rebuild their lives on better foundations. Then H. Make them aware of any consequences. You may need to appoint someone to walk with them in the journey toward their restoration. If they are a leader, they may need to be removed from leadership while they sort their life out. If it is potentially a legal or criminal issue, let them know you'll be contacting the authorities and the police. Always offer your support in whatever ways that you can. And please remember, the aim of corrective discipline is not to punish, but to instruct and restore. And conclude with a clear understanding by both parties of what changes are required. Ask them if they understand and if they're committed to future change. I pray with the person and get the person to pray. And listen to their prayer because you will really hear what they've heard of what you have to say. That's very important. And J, affirm them again with grace. Treat them as God treats us with undeserved kindness and grace. Affirm your belief that they can change and live a life by the Spirit's power. Reaffirm the benefits of repentance and correction and urge them to live right and righteously before God and then finish the meeting. Step number three, follow up with the person and the appropriate people. Now that you've had the difficult conversation, you'll need to take the next steps. Who needs to know? Who will take responsibility to help the person get their life together and over what time frame? How do we do this? Well, A, keep a written record of the meeting. Make notes on what happened, what was said and what you did about it. These records must be strictly confidential, objective and not prejudicial. B. Tell whoever needs to know on a need to know basis. If the issue is an internal issue, like they have a bitter attitude, it can remain between you and the person. But if the issue has affected, is affecting or will affect other people, you will have to communicate with your oversight, the relevant leadership body and the appropriate people. If the behavior or actions were illegal or involved a minor, for example, a teenager or a child, you will have to consult with your pastor or denominational hierarchy because of the legal implications in most jurisdictions. You'll also have to report the incident to the police or the relevant authorities, but please do so as soon as possible. If the issue involves a church leader, it must be referred to your pastor and or the church eldership or board then the leadership of the church will take whatever disciplinary action is necessary. In almost every case relating to the discipline of leaders, share the conversation with your oversight. C. Arrange for the appropriate people to help the person. 
Now it is time to put assistance and an accountability structure in place to help the person get back on track. In some scenarios, this will involve organizing a counselor or coach. At other times, it will be organizing for accountability in their life. For still others, it will simply be providing wise and conscientious people to walk with them as a friend or guide. And D, keep confidentiality. Keep records and details of the circumstances confidential, aside from those who need, need to know. The only time a matter of corrective discipline would be public was if it involved a senior leader, like a pastor, being dismissed for a serious breach of integrity. Fortunately, this is a rare occurrence. But on a related issue, if someone comes to you and says, I need to confess to you something, will you please keep it to yourself? You must add a qualifying statement like, look, I really want to listen and to help you, but if your confession is something illegal or serious, then I may need to refer it on to my oversight or the authorities. Do you still want to tell me? We want to help you, but sometimes I am not the best person to help you. And there are some things that you cannot keep com confidential because it is too important. So you need to let the person know up front. E, follow up with the person. Follow up with the person from time to time to see how they're going. A friendly, encouraging, informal chat could be enormously helpful for, for the person. They must never feel rejected or marginalized by you as a leader, but loved, accepted, and valued. And this is crucial because our goal is their full restoration. This final thought on their full restoration is what we'll unpack in the third and final session of this module. And we'll be talking about how to restore people after they've been disciplined. I'll see you then. God bless.